I'd like to preach to you a message from the book of Genesis entitled, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. I do not always title my messages after Clint Eastwood Westerns, but over the next uh, few Sundays we'll be preaching A Fistful of Dollars, Hang Em High, and no, no, we won't. We won't be doing that. But actually, as I read this passage in Genesis 33, it was very clear to me that there's a lot of good, there is some bad, and then it ends with something ugly. So it just kind of fit. Let's, let's ask the Lord that he would open up our, our hearts and our minds from the word of God today. Lord, we love you. We thank you for those folks that are here. We thank you for the home folks, Lord, and those that have been so faithful to this church over the years and uh, faithful to you. Uh, Lord, I thank you for those that are visiting as well. And Lord, we just pray that you would, in, in a, a great way that stands on your promises, that is full of your faith, that you would speak to us now. And uh, get me out of the way. I pray that you would, you would use every bit of uh, the um, illustration, that, uh, the exposition, to talk to the folks. I pray, Lord, that they would not hear this as some kind of a, a speech, a message, Lord, they, they would hear it as I am faithful to the text as the very word of God. And Lord, I'm asking particularly for this message that you would, uh, you would give them the courage to uh, obey the word of God. And me too, Lord. And I pray that you will bless these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who makes all of our Christian life possible. Amen. Perhaps it was a small thing. I don't know. Maybe a, a misunderstanding that happened. I, I don't know. Maybe it's the end of church. Perhaps it was, was a, a disagreement about their mutual families that, that caused the stir. Maybe it was a rude comment spoken in haste, or maybe it was kind of the continual butting of heads. We're not told. All that we know that is that Paul addresses two women in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Philippians, uh, whose name was, were Eodius and Syntyche, or however you pronounce that second name. And he begs them, under the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the Holy Spirit, he begs them that they would be of one mind. That these two women in this church would would be in agreement, one mind. You know, they're not going to see everything from the same perspective. They're not going to say the same thing. This is talking about a harmony of deferring to each other, of preferring one another, of of not judging one another, of of receiving and embracing one another. This is one mind, one accord that the Bible talks about so often. So we don't know what these two women were fighting about at all, but here is a command. He begs them in Philippians, and we'll come back to it at the end, that they would stop it, that they would be of one mind. Unfortunately, disagreements, disputes, arguments that lead to resentment, anger, and even bitterness are common among people And I I hate to say this, pretty common even among God's people, among believers. You know, and I think that we don't, it's kind of unrealistic. Um, Have you ever been to a church where there wasn't some contention at some point? I think it's kind of unrealistic to think that you personally will never have a contention with someone. You know, we, we, we have human wills and, you know, we have our own perspectives and our own desires and we see things a certain way. And, And that, that is just what happens, that's just how it will be. But what we must fight about, you know, not to use that pun, but what we must fight about is the understanding that ongoing contention and broken relationships is never the will of God. What, what we must fight for is one-mindedness again. And what we must fight for is receiving and embracing each other again. Listen to God's very word on this in so many places. I think I could have gotten three times the amount of verses just as proof text just to show you. But Romans 15, 6 says that you may be of one mind and, and one mouth glorify God. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 says it this way. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Uh, be, be of good comfort. Perfect means be mature, okay? Be mature, be complete in the Lord. Be of, of good comfort, be of one mind. There's again, live in, what's the next word? Yell that. Peace, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Philippians 2, 2 says it this way, fulfill you my joy that ye might be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. 
1 Peter 3.8 says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love his brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, and I just remind you again when he's saying, be of one mind, we all must be solid from the same perspective on core doctrine. But we're going to see things differently. But the one mindedness and the one accord that is mentioned the whole way through the New Testament is deferring to each other and not pounding your perspective or your view or your attitude into someone else. One accord, one mind that God is calling for is a harmony. I don't know a lot about, about harmony, a lot, a lot about music. I like to sing. I like me a banjo. <laughs> That's just a joke, West Virginia joke. But I do know that in harmony, there are different notes that aren't the same notes that are in a, in a chord that are harmonizing together, although they're different. That's a good view of what we're supposed to be like in a church, supposed to be like with other believers. God calls for one accord, one mind. Contentions will happen, but God commands that when these disputes arise, we don't just ignore them. You know, the phrase, time heals all wounds, is probably the greatest lie, unbiblical lie out there. Because that's not how God intended it. When these disputes arise, they are to be dealt with in full reconciliation. And that reconciliation is what we're going to like, look at today in the life of of Jacob in this series, Origins, the study of Genesis. We have preached right up to chapter 33. Would you stand, please? And we'll read these 20 verses together. Genesis 33. Genesis 33. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and, and looked, and behold, Esau came. And with him, 400 men. Look up here just a moment. So if you haven't been with us, we've been preaching up through here. You know, Esau, his brother, had vowed to murder him 20 years earlier, and in chapter 32, he's scared to death, and he's praying, and he's weeping, and he's calling out for God to protect him, and blah, 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 and he is petrified, and, and here Esau is coming at him with 400 men. Let's keep reading. And he divided the children unto Leah, and unto Rachel, and unto uh, the two handmaids, and he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph uh, hindermost. Benjamin hadn't been born yet. Joseph, Rachel, Joseph's son. Jo I mean, Joseph, Rachel's son. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he, until he came near his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children. He said, who, who are those with thee? And, and he said, the children which God hath gracious, graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaids came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after that, Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. And he said, what meanest thou by all this drove which I met? You know, the, all of this company probably could be hundreds of servants had met Esau bef with gifts, remember, before he, he got to, to Jacob. And he said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough. My, my brother, keep that that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, no, or nay, I, I pray thee, if now I have, given, I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present or my gift at, at my hand, for therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. And he said, let us take our journey, and let us go, and I will go before thee. That's um, Esau speaking. And he said unto him, my Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and the herds with my young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, this is Jacob talking, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly or slowly, carefully, uh, according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure, until I come unto my Lord, unto Seir. And that is where uh, evidently Esau was camped. We saw that in 32. And Esau said, let me now leave with me some of the folk which 
uh, that are with me, the 400 men. And he said, what needeth it? Let, let me, or I don't, I don't need it. Let me find grace in thy sight of my Lord. And he saw return that day on his way unto Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. And therefore, the name of the place is called Booth, Sukkoth. Uh, and Jacob came to Shalem, uh, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram and pitched his tent before the city. And he, brought, he bought a parcel of a field, uh, which, he, which or excuse me, where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, uh, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. He erected there an altar and called it Eloi Elohi Israel. You may be seated. That's about the extent of my pronunciation. I'll just tell you that. One thing that has been so authentic av- as we have seen uh, the book of Genesis, and honestly, it is a great proof to the authentic authenticity of the Bible, is that when God shows you his children, he shows you all the warts too. He doesn't try to hide it. And, you know, there are there are many scholars that recognize that, you know, this, that you know, God doesn't have to fake what he does, the grace that he does in people's lives, even though we are still left with our flesh. And this is seen over and over in the story of Jacob and how God had, had miraculously saved him at Bethel and was, and was changing his life, and yet there are still uh, warts that are left. And this story that we hit here in chapter 33 is no different. This is so authentic to our own Christian lives. We have seen Jacob making progress, growing, and then taking two steps backwards, three steps forward, and all of that. We see here in the story, in chapter 33, the good, the bad, and the ugly about reconciliation, about him making things right, reconciling his brother. After 20 years being with crooked Laban, God told Jacob to head to his homeland, to get out of there, to Canaan. He does that. He obeys God. But he's intercepted by his brother Esau and 400 men who, who Jacob calls an army coming after him. He thinks the worst. Esau had vowed, as I have said, to kill Jacob 20 years before because Jacob deceived him, took advantage of him and, and his father, actually. And we have seen Jacob's great fear in chapter 32. Now here is the actual meeting. One commentator on this chapter, 33, states that this meeting is a classic model of reconciliation because there are definite things here for us to learn and to understand about when we have offended someone or they have offended us and how to reconcile again. And let me just say this from the beginning. You know, we're going to talk about reconciliation, the whole message. I'm going to bring you to the point at the end to, to apply this strongly in your life. But what is better is that the offense not happened in the first place. Yeah? You know what's better than apologizing and asking for forgiveness? Not to offend the person at the beginning. We ought to always lean in to the fruit of the Spirit in interactions. And I am learning this sometimes the hard way. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, whatever. I want to say something before we begin. Each of us in this room have had conflicts with other people. And they are uncomfortable, aren't they? and confusing often, and and sinful, and stressful, and ugly, and disheartening. And guess what? You're going to have more conflicts in your life. And I guarantee you that this sermon is not going to solve all your conflicts. So what I'm saying is we need the Holy Spirit through these words in chapter 33 to grow us from this chapter, and, and, and so that we will be thinking And we will be considering those that perhaps we are having conflicts with or have had conflicts with. And and what the Holy Spirit would want us to do about that. That, you say, well, you know, I don't want to talk about, you know, that I'm not right with this certain person. Admit it. That's a good starting place. (laughs) All right. First of all, let's see, please, the good. The good in the reconciliation. In this reconciliation with Esau, there are several good things to notice. Number one, humility. Humility. Jacob is not the same sinful, prideful surplanter who had tricked his his brother and dad. And we've walked through that the last couple weeks. Through his time with Laban, God has humbled him a great deal. And I believe what we will... What we see here is that his attitude has changed, and his attitude towards Esau uh, is, is humility. 
It is not, you know, you might say, well, he's doing this because he's afraid, whatever, and he's manipulating the situation and acting this way. No, there seems to be a true and a real humility. You remember he designed this, this elaborate scheme of waves or groups to go uh, in, ca- in his caravan to meet Esau so that as, as Esau would be walking along with his 400 men, different waves would meet him and give him gifts. And, and way in the back, way, way in the back of this whole clan of people is Jacob with his big family. Notice, please, in verse number 3 in chapter uh, 33, that Jacob sees him. So let's read that, 33.3. It says, And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So he sees Esau away off. Maybe it's a big plain. And, he, and as he begins to come near him, he begins bowing. And he bows seven times. I don't think this is just some random number. Because we see, and I'm, I'm not big on numerology in Scripture. I'm going to just tell you that. You know, when you, you, all these articles that talk about, if you look at the 57th verse or the second thing, you know, I'm, I'm not big in numerology. I think God, what God does, he generally does straightforwardly. However, you see the repetition of things in seven in Scripture that talk about completion and talk about maturity and going really the whole way, the complete amount. And I think that this is what the Lord is saying. I think this is why Jacob is bowing. He may not even realize that he bowed seven times, but it shows full and complete humility of Jacob before Esau, that when he is coming before his brother, having, you know, realized he was the offender 20 years ago, he really messed with his brother, but he has humbled himself in view of the conflict. He is putting, by bowing, see him coming near and near to Esau, by bowing. Yes, there's some cultural thing, Middle Eastern thing. That is not what the Lord is pointing out in the, in the, in the passage. It's showing how humble Jacob was and that he is taking this seriously and he's putting himself under his brother. In verse number five, we continue to see this humility. Uh, Jacob calls himself Esau's servant. I am your servant. Again, this is not just verbiage. It's not just Middle Eastern verbiage of how you greet someone. You know, we, we sometimes sign our lever, letters, right, or emails, you know, your servant or something like that, or something that has to do with that, yours truly, which means I, I give you myself. This is not just this. There is a humility here. I am your servant, Jacob says to Esau. Also in verse 6 and 7, if you look there, Jacob has instructed his family to bow and the Lord takes a couple of verses so that we'll see that all of this all of his children his his two wives two handmaids four wives you know that that in their children as they're coming to Esau he has instructed them they know to bow and I think that that's important that's important to show humility when I first read and kind of imagined this going on this these waves of 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 people and then the family and the bowing and the servitude whatever especially when his family starts bowing. I couldn't help apply this to real-time conflicts, so listen, listen through this a little bit. I couldn't help but apply this to real-time conflicts when we get uh, those close to us involved in a dispute. Isn't that kind of normal? When we're, you have a conflict with someone else, whether it be your wife or whether it be family members or whatever, we start telling them about it. And do we tell that story completely fairly? We tell it from our own perspective, of course, our own bias, what someone has done to us. And no matter, you know, we probably generally uh, are the victim in the story. And this person did this to us. And I'm, I'm sure this is what is going on here. They probably have heard this story. I mean, they, what the family is thinking is, okay, something happened with Jacob. Maybe they totally don't understand it all. But his brother is coming and has vowed to murder him. Poor daddy. It really wasn't poor daddy at all. We often drag those people, they're our friends, close friends, and our family along in our conflict. We seed their thoughts against the person that we're fighting with. But what is really good here in this story, and I think we can learn from, is seeing these, the family and the children, the wives, bowing to Esau. What's really good in Jacob's family is they have been instructed by Jacob, no doubt, to bow to Esau. There is an acknowledgement here that Jacob is humbling himself before his brother that he wronged, and that humility is understood by those that were the closest to him and knew at least some things about the offense. And I'm saying that because I want you to connect it to yourself and when you're going through a conflict with someone else. I wonder if when God finally humbles you, humbles us, 
it makes you aware that, you know, at least partially you were in the wrong or maybe 100% in the wrong. I wonder is, if when God shows us our wrong, if we are so thorough as to go back and inform those that we badmouth the person to. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying it's great to talk about reconciliation, and it's great when Jacob and Esau in verse number four are embracing, but there is probably a lot of conversation that happened with other people, with his own family, before we get to that point. And in our conflicts, and when, when we are struggling with someone else, it is very natural to be able to talk to those, or even counselors or people or family that is near us. But when God works on our hearts, and when God humbles us like he's humbling Jacob, do we go back and tell the people that the Lord has humbled us and that we were wrong, at least in some part of it? We have to humble ourselves if we are going to be reconciled with those that we are in conflict with. And this is what we first see here is Jacob's humility. And that's very hard sometimes because we each see from our own perspective. And if you are like me, you just get real bullheaded in seeing things just from your side. And so when you're fighting with somebody else, you know, all you can see is your side, your side, your side, your side. And it takes a great dose of God-giving, Holy Spirit enacting humility to let you let go of that bias. Humility. Are we mature enough to admit when we are wrong? Are we mature enough to desire the reconciliation more than be proven right? Let me ask you again. Are we like Christ enough have we grown maturely enough? Are we looking at God's perspective of how much he loves the fact that he, through salvation, through what Christ did on the cross, created a family, the body of Christ, the church, those who are brothers and sisters, children of the high king, and he loves them to be in great unity together. Do we love that unity? more than we love being proven right. You say, be proven right, Pastor. Just move on to the next place. I, I just want to be right. God wants unity between brothers and sisters in Christ. Satan wants turmoil. Who will we encourage to win? Who will we, who will we allow to win by how we handle our conflict? We must lower ourselves, literally, Jacob is bowing down to the ground, down to the ground, seven times to be right with others. It doesn't really matter if we are right. It matters much more that we are right with each other. See that play on words? Does it really matter if we're right? It matters much more that we're right with other people. And by the way, God wants us to be at peace with all men. As much as lieth in us, live at peace with all men. And that's believers and unbelievers. God has given us the motivation to be reconciled with someone else. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And here it is. Here's, here's your motivation. Even as God, for Christ's sake, or because of what Christ did, hath forgiven you. So let me read that again. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. There's what we're supposed to do. Even as God, the motivation, because of this reason, God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. This verse should change your mind any time that you're hesitant or resistant to make things right with someone else. No one has ever sinned against us as much as we have sinned against God. There is no comparison between whatever anyone will do to you uh, compared to what you have done to God. A lifetime of offensiveness of breaking his commands in your heart and out of your heart. Okay, I'm just going to say that. And yet God... For the sake, because of the act and pet petition and the work of Christ who died on the cross to make it happen, yet God, in view of the great offenses, offenses toward him, because of the work of his son, has forgiven you all your trespasses every time you've ever sinned a lifetime. When he made you born again by trusting Christ, he has forgiven all all of your sins, and justified you. And he says, let that be your motivation for when anyone has done anything wrong against you, that you might readily forgive them. 
It was certainly our Savior who hung on the cross for us, who said in his final words, in light of those who are presently crucifying him, presently bleeding him out, presently killing him, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, what an example our Savior is to us about reconciliation and conflicts. No one has ever beat, pierced, or hung you on a cross. We can, by the example of Christ and by the power of Christ, we can and we must reconcile with others. The good of humility, but we see another good here, the good of sweet reconciliation. I don't know any, any better way to say it. Sweet reconciliation. Look at verse number four. It's a, it's a beautiful scene, and Esau ran and to meet him, embraced him, and fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. What a beautiful scene, and how beautiful it is when those who have been estranged humble themselves, put their differences behind them, and reconcile. That is a beautiful thing. That is almost a miracle. That is a great and a wonderful thing. Just like that, this scene, though, it takes two to be willing to do this. It takes two. It, it has to be you and the person who has wronged you or the person that you have wronged. It takes two to tango and it takes two to reconcile. Both parties have to be fully willing. See the eagerness in Esau's run to embrace Jacob. All right, so this is real-time stuff. This really happened. All right, can you, you can imagine how petrified Jacob is and uh, waiting to see Esau and these 400 men. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're passing the companies and whatever, and then Esau breaks into a run towards Jacob. What would you have been thinking? Where's my sword? No! But when he comes closer, it's obvious that there is not anger on his face. There is love on his face. And he wraps his arms around his brother, his younger brother by seconds, his twin. And they just, can you see him collapsing there and just weeping and Jacob, all of that remorse and fear and hesitancy just melts away as they cry and they weep and they hug and they embrace. It's a sweet sight. Do you have that eagerness to be right with somebody who you're estranged from. That, that love of harmony, the, the, what made it possible that we have, especially other believers, that we should desire greatly. Isn't that so much better than stewing, stewing, stewing? Certainly the power of Jesus coming up from the grave, that resurrection power that Romans says is available to us to do things that we couldn't normally do in the members of our flesh. Certainly the resurrection power should give us the power to stop stewing and start, start seeking reconciliation with our brother. You say it's hard. It's incredibly hard. It is incredibly hard. And what the devil wants to whisper in your ears, it won't do any good, it's going to make things worse. He is great at saying that. And that's, you know, we, we sang standing on the promises, didn't we? Okay, we talked about, this is my word, the choir, that was awesome. This is my word. Speak, O Lord, the word. Well, guess what? The, sometimes you've got to trust the word more than you trust what's going to happen as the result. Sometimes you've got to obey the word despite whatever might happen or whatever could happen. It doesn't matter. Obeying God's more important than the result. He wants you to strive for reconciliation. He wants you to strive to be right with your brother or sister. See them embrace. See them fall on each other. Kiss and weep. Isn't that much better than gossiping, stewing, anger, hurt, and bitterness? It's pretty cool, and I didn't see this, and I kicked myself that I didn't see it, but in Luke 15, you guys remember the story of the prodigal son? Say yes, amen if you do. Remember what? Midsummer Sunday's nap. Wake up! It's pretty cool that Jesus Christ, when he's telling that story, when he comes to the end of the reconciliation between the son and the father, uses nearly the exact words that are mentioned here. In fact, I think it's probably pretty clear that he was thinking of the reconciliation of Jacob and Esau when he uses the words when the son, the prodigal son, embraces his father, ran, fell on his neck, kissed him. The father ran, fell on his neck, kissed him. 
It is like Jesus is thinking about this sweet moment when Jacob and Esau had reconciled, when the walls came down, when we see humility in action, full embracing of someone once estranged from us. And that may seem impossible to you, but do we not serve the God that we say can do miracles? Okay, if Jesus Christ can walk on the water, can he not give you the power to be right with that person you're estranged with? Just very honestly. Can he not change your heart? Can he not change their heart? It's about time we start, you know, we, we pray for the God of miracles to heal, to heal baby joy. Well, how about praying that the God of miracles would heal my heart and heal that other person's heart so that we can reconcile the way the Lord wants us to be? The God of miracles can do it. Notice Jacob's language in verse number 10, the last part, for therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God. This is all amazing the way he's feeling. And thou wast pleased with me. I saw you, brother, and the, the look on your face was not kill Jacob. The look on your face was love Jacob. The look on your face, I could tell you were pleased with me. God had changed Esau's heart and he didn't feel the same hate that he had felt 20 years before when he vowed to kill his brother. And when Jacob saw him, there was love in his eyes that had forgiven Jacob's sin and put the offense so far away that it could actually be said, you were pleased with me. When I saw you, no more do you want to murder me. You were pleased with me. From, think about that. From hate to being pleased. Only God could do that. Only God could do that. Listen, believer, I've struggled with anger and bitterness just like you, but God is so strong and powerful. Christ's salvation is so strong within us. The power of that indwelling Holy Spirit, we're told in the word of God, is full of fruits of love that I don't have. That he can turn our hate uh, for someone into being pleased with them. Will you humble yourself and ask God uh, to do that for you and someone you're presently having a conflict with? Listen, God's ways are beautiful and unity and reconciliation and embracing and fully you know, embracing each other is beautiful to him. He wants you to pursue the beauty of verse number four with people you are estranged with. Number three, the good of graciousness. The good of graciousness. Look at verse number eight. Get, let's get back there and jump back into the story. Verse number eight. And he said, what meanest thou by all this drove which I am meant? Look up here. He's, he's not just talking about all the people, the company. He's talking about the gifts, the presents that were, you know, like, you remember there was over 500 animals, like goats and all those animals given before he ever reached Jacob. Can you imagine 500 that's a lot of sheep. That's a lot of goats. He's like, what, what do you mean by all this stuff? And he said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. We already mentioned uh, Jacob's elaborate scheme to, to give over 500 animals and groups to Esau as he approached him. We, we mentioned that last week. I won't, I won't move off of the word scheme because I don't, I don't think this was necessary. I think that you see his weakness of trying to manipulate the situation right alongside of him calling on the Lord to help. But, but there is something here, and I don't, think it was, I don't think it was necessary, especially by Esau's comments here, that, that it changed his heart. That didn't cha- the animals didn't change his heart. God had changed his heart in 20 years. Okay, so, so I don't think that he needed to do that at all. But I do want to make a quick point about all this, all these gifts. It may be true that this was Jacob's unspoken attempt at restitution for the stolen birthright and the blessing. He was not the elder son. With a bowl of beans, he manipulated, forced Esau into giving him his birthright. That had a lot, that, that had financial ramifications. It had spiritual ramifications. And then he took his, the blessing, he tricked his dad and acted like he was Esau, and, and, his, and his blind dad couldn't tell the difference, and gave him, you know, blessed his rest of his life, which God um, actually enacted on that blessing. We can't say for sure that this is restitution for what he had done, but he is insistent for Esau to keep all those flocks. He even uses the term, check out verse number 11, he even uses the term, take, dot, 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 take my blessing. He uses the term, my blessing, for all these flocks of what he is giving to 
to, uh, to Esau, and remember, he had stolen the blessing. Same word he uses. Sometimes it is proper in reconciling with someone to give them restitution, depending on the circumstances. 2 Corinthians 7 is a beautiful scene. In fact, if you're jotting notes, write down 2 Corinthians 7. Go to that and, and check out the middle verses about the repentance of Corinth, about an issue, and it explains what that looks like, true repentance looks like. But one of the things it says that true repentance will be, will be clear in all the matter. That is, we'll do everything that is lacking to make the situation right. And that would include sometimes restitution. If you know what restitution is, it means like if you've stolen something, that you give it back. Um, You remember when Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and uh, he had stolen from the people, collecting taxes, and when he Spent time with Jesus. I believe he, he came to Christ as a believer in going to his house that day, going to your house to stay. You don't know that song? That's why you go to Sunday school, so you can learn those big songs. And when, he, when Zacchaeus, after he came to Christ, he said, if I have stolen from you, uh, taken money from you, and he did, I will re- repay that, and there was, a, there was interest on it. I'll pay it so many times over. Restitution is part of repentance. If you're not right with someone because you owe them or you've stolen from them or damaged something, make it right. Make it right. Repay it. Make it right. That goes a long way in restoration. The good, now the bad. We gotta go on to the bad. I want to point out quickly two things in this story that aren't quite right. (laughs) When we think about biblical restoration, especially spelled out in the New Testament, when we think about someone we're not right with and and how to be right with them. First of all, notice, flip back over to to chapter 32, and I want you to look at at verse number 11. The Bible says, (coughs) it's Jacob, you remember, he's just praying out to the Lord uh, in light of meeting Esau. He says, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me, and the mother <coughs> with the children. That means in, in total slaughter. It was a saying of the time. So Jacob's prayer here in chapter 32, and then look over at uh, 32, 22, where he is weeping, praying, and wrestling with the Lord. When he's crying out to the Lord, something is missing. Something's missing. What is missing in Jacob's prayer and brokenness is any mention of the desire to reconcile with his brother. So what is this prayer? This prayer sounds like, deliver me, deliver me, don't let him slaughter me and my family. (coughs) It looks like a cry of protection that doesn't include, Lord, I have offended my brother, I want to be right with him again. Please reconcile me. Actually, it doesn't seem like reconciliation is even in view with Jacob meeting Esau until Esau runs, embraces him, (coughs) and then He breaks down and weeps, and then, you know, they reconcile. It doesn't even seem like that's, he wasn't thinking very spiritually. And that's a problem that is very applicable to you and me. When we are in conflict with someone else, do you just want to be relieved of the stress and the anxiety of the moment, the trouble of the moment, because it's extremely awkward to go by that person at church or at work or, you know, or or whatever? Is that what you're praying? Is that why you want to be Or do you really want to be right with your brother or sister? Do you really want to make your Christianity look look like what God wants it to be, that that beauty of harmony and peace among believers? Are you just saying, I'm tired of of being troubled by that person? That's not the right prayer. You know, Jacob in 32 was off off track. He should have been wanting to be right with Esau, especially because he was the offender. Can you say with the psalmist and meet it in Psalm 133.1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Is that your heart's desire? It's God's desire. And we're going to have to beat on our flesh and, 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 and strive for humility until the day we die probably in this thing. But this is what our Lord wants. The second thing here that, that could be considered wrong or bad is that Jacob never really comes out in 33 at all 
and admits his sin against Esau. Do, do you see any verses in there that says, oh man, I am so sorry that I tricked you out. You know, with bowl of beans, I manipulated you to get the blessing. Do you see anything like that? Well, it's implied, Pastor. You know what implied is? It's garbage. You can write that down. Whitmer says implied is garbage. This in reconciling with someone, uh, implied <coughs> confession and request for forgiveness is not enough. It is not restitution. It is not, it is not reconciliation. Uh, so <coughs> here's what that sounds like. If I have offended you, what? What, what was that? If I have offended you. That covers everything. One time back in 1976, I parked in your parking place. If I have offended you. That's not, that's not, rest, that's not confession. That's not making things right with someone. It should be, because I did this, would you please forgive me? Do you see the difference? And if you can only come halfway, then come halfway. So that sounds like this. I realize that I have done some things that hurt you, and I want to take responsibility for that. Would you please forgive me? In my home, we, we, we try to, we need to be more consistent, I guess, with this, but from the time the kids were young, we wouldn't let them say, I'm sorry. What does that mean? You are sorry that you smacked your sister up in the head. Yeah, you're right. You're a sorry kid. That doesn't mean really anything. That, you know what that means? I feel bad. What? That I got caught? Uh, that my dad spanked me? No, that is not the same as saying, I did this. Will you please reconcile with me? Or for, will you forgive me? Will you please embrace me again because I'm admitting what I've done wrong? Well, at first Esau doesn't, uh, he kindly says, you know, don't know, don't keep the gifts, whatever, keep the gifts of the flocks. He, he, he says, I don't need them. He, he doesn't need them to reconcile with his brother. But Jacob insists, insists, and that kind of seals the deal then in, that, in the, that portion of chapter 33 about the reconciliation. So that, that pretty much is done. And that brings us to the last point, the good, the bad, and now the ugly. Look at verse number 12, please. Verse number 12 says, And he said, Let us take our journey. Let us go, and I will go before thee. And he said unto him, So it looks like verse number 12, Esau's talking. Verse number 13, Jacob's responding. And my Lord knoweth that the children are tender. He says, I got young children, and the flocks and the herds with young are with me, and they got little lammies. And, and if we should... If the men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. So, so, so Esau says, okay, let's go. Let's travel together. The ugly. They've agreed, evidently, that they would, they would go to Esau's city of, of Seir together. And uh, they've embraced. They probably talked for a long, long time, got cut up. And that they would travel together uh, before Jacob would continue to go to, to Beersheba, his homeland, in Canaan. Seir was about 160 miles south of the meeting place of the reconciliation. So they're going to travel due south about 160 miles to go to where Esau lives. Beersheba was west, a good ways west, like probably, I don't know, 40, 50 miles west of Seir. Well, in verse number 13, Jacob makes the excuse that his children and flocks are young and frail and, and they need to move slowly. So Esau, you go ahead and just go ahead. So Esau, you know, he says, okay, well, I'll go ahead, but let me leave some of these 400 men to help you with, you know, your big company, all these flocks or whatever, and, and, and they can help you, you know, come, you know, and serve you, whatever. Well, Jacob dodges that in verse number 14 by saying, oh, oh no, I don't need any help. What is going on here? Folks, I, I'm afraid that what we're seeing here is Jacob not being fully honest with Esau that, that he really didn't want to go to his camp. <laughs> and he didn't really want to spend time with him there. I think we see Jacob kind of turning into his kind of old self. 
Likely, he didn't want to be with the man that he had feared for 20 years. That would be awkward. Maybe, maybe he thought uh, he was still afraid of the violent vindication. Maybe they're going to get me down to Seir, and then they're going to slaughter us. Maybe he thought that. Perhaps he didn't think that they could dwell together in peace. You know, that was great, this reconciliation here. It's great weeping and embracing, and great, I'm not afraid you're not going to kill me anymore, but I don't think that I can be around you. And I hope this is starting to hit home to some of you the way that we reason sometimes with people we haven't been right with. Maybe he just thought that someday, you know, and, and this is the most gracious way to, to, to think about it. This is giving him a lot of credit, but maybe he thought, someday I will go to Seir, but not now. Someday I'll, I'll go and I'll keep my word and I'll see Esau again in, in his own town or in his own camp, encampment. He does not. He doesn't. And he doesn't see Esau again, his brother, until he has to see him in chapter 35 because their father died and they have to come together to bury him. Instead, throw up the map, boys. Instead, that's my handwriting. It's pretty rough. Instead, if you can see it at the top, it says Sukkoth in green. You see that? There's a dot there. Seir, you see, is the blue down below. All right, that's where Esau lives. The meeting is in black. And uh, in Shechem is the place where, he'll, where Jacob will end up eventually. Instead of heading from the black to the blue, when Esau clears, you know, when he gets his company going the next day or whatever, strangely, Jacob turns north exactly the opposite way. And he travels some distance there, and, and, and he makes... He buys land and builds a house and builds these little booths, or maybe they're like little barns, branches, for all of his animals. Like he's, you know, he's hunkering down to live there. Many commentators feel that this was Jacob acting like his old self, making excuses, a little bit of deception to Esau, wanting to do a completely different thing. Instead of the Israel, the new name, who God had made him, he was off track and we probably would use the word backsliding. He was, he was doing, he wasn't, he wasn't headed to Canaan and he wasn't tr- trying to honor the reconciliation with his brother that they could spend time together now that they're reconciled. He just seems to be off track. And that's, this brings up a valid question about our reconciliations with people, with someone. Have you really forgiven them and been restored to each other if you are not willing to be around them anymore? So, real time, you make excuses so you don't have to spend time with them anymore, even after you've made things right. I want to let you grapple with that question, because I think it's very real, and I don't think it's, it's in view of what is supposed to happen when you make things right with each other. Esau was willing and eager to be with Jacob. He wanted to, hey, let's go together, let's travel down to my encampment, we'll spend time, it'll be great, we'll throw the football around, it'll be great, we'll be brothers again. They were old, by the way, at this time. They are like almost 100 years old, but in those years, you know, it was not, not as old. Well, instead of that, he, he just kind of heads the opposite direction in a cloud of lame excuses that really have no validity. Jacob stays in Sukkoth a, a good amount of, of years, it seems, several years. And what is interesting about that in his time, when you see the word, you, there's no mention of him worshiping or building our altars there. There's no mention of him walking with God during this time. It's like he's off track. Well, finally, he seems to get back to obeying God where, where, and headed where God had told him to go, and he journeys to Shechem, which is in the promised land. He stays there for a while. He buys some land, and we see, we see him finally building an altar there. That was the red on the left side, and, and worshiping the Lord there. And you see that at the end of the passage. Look, please, at verse number 20. It says, And he erected there an altar, and called it Elo, Elo, he, he Israel. And I believe we, we see that he's coming on back on track after he drifted for a little while because he names this altar literally God, the God of Israel. And you say, oh, that's great, the God of his nation. No, it wasn't named, the nation wasn't named that. He was named that. So it would be like God, he's building this altar, God, the God of Toby, or the God of myself, or we would say, my God, God, my God. He's getting back on track again. 
This story in chapter 33, folks, is a story about reconciliation, about when you are not right with each other and you need to get right with each other. And if God did what I suppose that he has promised by his Holy Spirit, what the choir sang about, about how the word falls from heaven like rain and like snow that brings forth fruit, brings forth grass, brings forth living things, I suppose that he is working in your heart about someone that you're not right with and that you need to reconcile with. Please obey his voice and reach out to that person. The classic New Testament passage on this is Matthew 18. It is so clear about how you do that. The scripture says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So that's kind of the first step. And if he hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. I mean, there's reconciliation there. If he listens to you, if you guys humble yourself to each other. But if he will not hear thee, then take thee one or two more. These are other believers with you that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Notice it mentions taking, if you can't, you, you first you go alone. You keep the offense as small as possible. But if you, if you can't make headway doing that, um, then uh, take other, take, ha, get the help of other b- respected believers, not to bully, not to gang up on this guy, but to try to work things out between you and the guy. And what is interesting about that, in the opening illustration of the two women, Eodius and Syntyche, from Philippians 4, 2, the very next verse says, tells believers in the church, maybe one specific believer in the church, help these women to get right with each other. And so maybe the sermon to you this morning is if you have friends that aren't right with each other, it's time to step in and help. Well, that's none of my business. I'm sorry, but the Lord made it your business. Love what God loves. Believers being right with each other. Love what God loves, even an unbeliever that you're not at peace with, that you could get to be at peace with. Love what God loves. Going face to face to reconcile is the way to go. All right, get as close to face to face as you can. By that, you know, some, sometimes that's not possible. The person lives in another state and it, might take, it, it may, may take ear to ear. Get as close to face to face as you can. Not emails, not texts, not a post on your Facebook. Hey, you remember what you did to me 10 years ago? Privacy setting, everyone. (laughs) Everyone in the world reads it. No, as close to -to face-to-face as possible, whether you are the offended or the offender. Did you hear what I said? Whether you are the offended or or you are the offender. And that verse that I just read, Matthew 18, you are the offended. But what if you're the offender? The scripture says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, it says, therefore, throw it up. Can we throw it up? Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee. So he's offended by you. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then thou are then come and offer thy gift. This is in the worship of the, er, of the early believers, but it is in view of sacrificing. And you're going to worship, you're going to church, you're going to worship, and uh, to bring sacrifices of praises and tithes offer, whatever. It says before, before, before you can worship, If you know there's somebody that has something against you, you need to go and reconcile with that person. You see, our relationship with other people is a spiritual matter, and it is a worship matter. There's that great passage of Scripture that says if you're not right with your wife, your your prayers are not going to be heard. Ouch! Yowza! Oh, how Satan will hate it if you reconcile with a brother. If you make this hard attempt. Oh how the Lord will love it. If you reconcile with someone you are estranged with. Oh how your heart will be (coughs) clear and joyful. If you accomplish it. It will be very 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 hard. Likely. But this is a matter of obedience and faith. Go reconcile with your brother. Or 
your sister.